Let's pray together. Father, we just sang my prayer. Grace and mercy like a mighty river. May it, may it flow now incessantly from above. All of this, let it be spirit-led, full of the spirit. Let it be, Lord, you speaking to us through this man, though dead, still he speaks. And may it be that like his own ministry, where people would testify that he would leave them with a greater sense of the grandeur of God than ever before. Oh, God, would you do that again? In Jesus' name, amen. Sometimes reading only a few sentences can change your life. It's part of the romance of reading. You think you're just going to read a few pages and then suddenly just wham, God grabs you, picks you up, shakes you up, turns you around. I still remember where I was, where I was sitting. I still remember the, the color of the blue book, Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, I, I don't, don't think I'm gifted to remember the color of the carpet and all of that. I mean, you know you're gifted when you can hold people spellbound talking about Splenda. <laughs> We're most spellbound, John, when you're teaching us the splendor of Christ. So here I was reading Martin Lloyd-Jones' Exposition of Ephesians, Volume 3, The Unsearchable Riches of Christ. And uh, often I skip the preface, but I was reading the preface because this, it felt special. He preached these sermons in 1956, but he published it in 1979. So he's 79 years old, two years before his death. A 79-year-old Lloyd-Jones looks at the church of his day and offers a diagnosis. Says, this is what I see. This is the trouble, the greatest trouble in the church today. If I were asked to name the greatest trouble among Christians today, including those who are evangelical, I would say that it is our lack of spirituality and of a true knowledge of God. So watch what he's doing, saying the lack here is a lack of experience or spirituality and a lack of true knowledge of God. We lack both of those things. That's the great trouble today. And then he looked at the Apostle Paul to say this hasn't always been a problem. He said no man had a greater theological and intellectual understanding than the Apostle Paul, but at the same time, no man had a deeper personal experimental knowledge than the Apostle Paul. God had, had married those things in Paul's life to know doctrine and to know experience together. And he said the great problem in the church is the divorce of doctrine and life, the divorce of doctrine and experience, the separation of light and heat. And here's what he said, quote, there is nothing which I know of which is more unscriptural, which is more dangerous to the soul than to divide doctrine and life. There are certain superficial people who say, ah, I cannot be bothered with doctrine. I haven't the time. I'm a busy man. I haven't the time to read books, and perhaps I don't have the aptitude. I'm a practical man. I believe in living the Christian life. Let others who are interested in doctrine be interested in doctrine. Now, there is nothing that every New Testament epistles condemns more than this. You see what he's saying? If you look at the New Testament epistles and where these churches in their life have gone astray, Paul comes and says, do you not know? Meaning if you knew this, you wouldn't do that. It's the divorce of these things that's the problem. Lloyd-Jones says, 
It's no use saying, we're not interested in doctrine, we're concerned about life. If your doctrine is wrong, then your life will be wrong. The content of our doctrine determines the conduct of our life. Our life is always heralding what we believe, what we think. And so, as he looks at doctrine in life and its divorce, let's think about the danger. Why he's saying this is so unscriptural, so dangerous for us. Imagine that the Christian life is like a plane that's having to fly between two deadly mountains. We'll call them isms. You've got intellectualism and you've got emotionalism or sensationalism. And you've got the two wings of the plane, doctrine and life, doctrine and experience, light and heat. It it does no good to argue, well, which wing of the plane do we need? Because if you don't have emotion, if all you have is doctrine, you're going to veer off and crash into intellectualism. If you don't have doctrine, you're going to veer off and crash into emotionalism, sensationalism. You've got to have both wings of the plane for, Christian, for Christianity to flourish. And in fact, this may surprise you. He said, the, the way that you know that you're safe, that you're flying the right way, is if you're being criticized from both directions. He says, as long as I'm being criticized from from both sides, as long as somebody is saying to me, oh, you're nothing but an intellectual, always preaching doctrine, and then others are saying, oh, you're nothing but a charismatic, always preaching experience, then I'm happy. But if I stop hearing from one side or the other, then I need to look again at the foundations. And I, I prayed this morning like Francis was talking about, just for all the saints, Lord, you, you know what people need this morning. Here's, here's what I got. Maybe there's some of you here that this is what you need to hear most because ministry is hard and criticism comes and perhaps now you're living more, pursuing more the absence of conflict than the presence of the Spirit. That somehow you're living for the avoidance of criticism. And I'm speaking to pastors' wives as well, the women that are here. I'm so glad that you're here, so glad that you're part of this. And oftentimes, especially pastors' wives will say, how do you deal with criticism? When, when they're criticizing your man, how do, how do you handle that? And this is saying, it may be God's frowning providence helping you stay balanced, helping you stay. Either or people, by definition, are going to always criticize attempts to be both and. And he wasn't afraid of that. He cared more about faithfulness than he cared about the validation of others. And so what do we need today? He fought to keep together what God said belong together. When he saw it in the word, he said the word and the spirit belongs together. Why would you want light or heat? Why would you want doctrine or life? Why would you want word or spirit? Listen to Lloyd-Jones, quote, what was it that turned the world upside down? Was it just theological teaching? Was it just mere enunciation of correct doctrine? No, over and above that, there was this mighty demonstration of the spirit and power. How did those people turn the world upside down? The answer is that in the book of Acts, we have an account of a great revival. The spirit outpoured. What happened could not have happened otherwise. How did those churches come into being? Was it merely that the apostles taught correct doctrine? Of course not. It was the Spirit's demonstration and power which accompanied the correct doctrine. Correct doctrine can leave the church dead. 
You can have dead orthodoxy. You can have a church that's perfectly orthodox and perfectly useless. Over and above all of this, there was the demonstration, this unction, this authority, this outpouring of the Spirit's power, which is the only explanation of the astonishing things that happened. This is sometimes a, a, an intellectual place, reformed evangelicalism, or as Francis calls them, my, my smart friends. Here I am among my smart friends. And we, we can just prize doctrine. Think about for a moment, take an inventory of all that the disciples had before Pentecost. They'd been with Jesus in person, had seen his miracles, heard his teaching, They already had some practice in ministry as Jesus sent them out and to heal and preach. And they'd even witnessed, I witness his death and resurrection. Even more, he had opened their minds to understand the scriptures after his resurrection so they could see him in all the law and the prophets and writings. They had their biblical theology down too. And thus, how striking is it that Jesus said, wait. Oh, you're not ready. You don't have what you need. This is what Lloyd-Jones says. You would have thought that these men were now in a perfect position to go out to preach. But according to our Lord's teaching, they were not. They seem to have all the necessary knowledge, but that knowledge is not sufficient. Something further is needed is indeed essential. The knowledge is vital, for you can't be witnesses without it, but to be effective witnesses You need this power, this unction, this demonstration of the Spirit. Now, if this was necessary for these men who had all this, how much more is it necessary for all others who try to preach these things today? Do you feel that? And this is the story of his life. He fought to keep together word and spirit in a day when the church of Jesus Christ kept trying to separate them. He believed they belonged together. So what I want to do is I just want to look at his life first and show that in living color and then have a couple of lessons from his life. Originally, I had, what if Lloyd-Jones would come to this conference and speak to us and he had all the plenary addresses? What would he say about each one, and the message was way too long, and I don't believe that the Lord was going to cause time to stand still like the sun, so I just narrowed it down to two, the two things that I think most define him, preaching and praying in the power of the Spirit, devoting himself to the Word and prayer, both of them in the power of the Spirit. So we start with his life. The story of Lloyd-Jones sounds like something from a Hollywood script. He gave up fame and fortune to leave a lucrative medical profession in London in exchange for a pulpit in a poor, degraded place in Wales. Why? Lloyd-Jones' life was a canvas upon which God painted with bright and bold colors the surpassing power of the gospel to save to do what nothing else could do. I think the best way to structure his life would be to put it into five different movements, five trips, if you will. The first three were the trip from Wales to London, and then London to Wales, and then Wales back to London. And then the fourth trip would be the journey from London to the rest of the world, the wider world in his ministry. And then the fifth journey was the best one from London to heaven, to the glory. So we begin with trip number one, from Wales to London. This covers 1899 till till he's 25 years old, 1925. The story begins in South Wales, where he was born on December 20th, 1899. His parents, Henry and Margaret, had three boys, Harold, David Martin, and Vincent. Harold was two years older, Vincent was two years younger. Harold died at age 20. So Lloyd-Jones was 18 when his brother Harold died at 20 because of the Spanish influenza outbreak of 1918 where 20 million people died worldwide. So sorrow touched 
the Lloyd-Jones household there. Martin's father, Henry, owned a grocery shop at 106 Donald Street in Cardiff, South Wales. Cardiff was a, a cosmopolitan Welsh town, English-speaking in South Wales. Six years later, Martin's father sold the business and headed back to the heart of Southwest Wales to a smaller Welsh-speaking village of Langatho. His life was fairly carefree until the age of 10. He loved summer vacations, spending holidays with his grandfather Evans and, and the horses there. But at age 10, that carefree life would go up in flames. Farmers came to his father's shop to pay their outstanding bills with gold sovereigns. This is January 19th, 1910. He's 10 years old. They stood talking and smoking in the clothing section of the store, and some tobacco ash had obviously fallen on fabric and had lain smoldering. And then it ignited in the early hours of Thursday morning when everyone was asleep, and Martin had to be rescued by his father, who threw him from an upstairs window into the arms of three men standing below the whole house, and the shop went up in flames. One of the only items retrieved from the fire were those gold sovereigns which had been burned now and reduced to a solid mass of gold. This fire was a crushing blow, especially financially. This would plague the Lloyd-Jones family for a long time, even though they tried to hide it from their children. But these financial troubles, th this frowning providence was actually hiding a smiling face. What happened was the positive outcome of these financial losses, it, it became the impetus to push Martin to greater efforts in his scholarship. Martin was playing soccer one day in the village square, and a student assistant named Edwin Jones came and saw him there and decided to pull young Martin aside and give him some straightforward guidance for his future. He sternly warned him, unless he put his mind to his work, unless he took his studies seriously, he wouldn't gain a scholarship to the county secondary school like his brother had. These words hit home because Martin knew their financial situation meant if he didn't get that scholarship, there was no more education. So he did. He devoted himself to his studies. In the scholarship exams of 1911, he scored second place and scored even higher than his brother Harold had done two years earlier. Even more devastating than the fire of 1910 was the bankruptcy they had to declare in 1914. Their real financial position was exposed before the community put on public display. All the family owned was auctioned off to the highest bidder. Martin's father had to leave for Canada for a few months to look for work, but nothing materialized. July of 1914, Lloyd-Jones is 14 years old. His father boarded a ship to look for work in London, and Martin joined him later on August 3rd, which was a stirring time to be in London because the British had declared war on Germany that next day. He was there August 3rd. The next day, they declare war on Germany, World War I. Martin's father bought a dairy business. Family was reunited in London then in October of that year. The dairy business was so successful that eventually all the debts were repaid. Martin and Vincent were able to go to grammar school. Martin excelled there. In his senior examination in the summer of 1916, so he's 16 years old, he passed all seven subjects and gained distinction in five of them. So he applied to the most prestigious medical school there in London, St. Bartholomew's Hospital, often called Bart's, in London. He was accepted at the unusually young age of 16. Martin was a standout student there. In particular, his diagnostic ability attracted the attention of one of the most distinguished faculty members at Bart, Sir Thomas Horder, who was the king's physician. On one occasion, Lloyd-Jones even made a diagnosis based on his claim that he could feel an enlarged spleen in the abdomen of the patient. This was something that even Horder's own examination had missed, and so he was so impressed that he invited Martin to be his junior house physician even before the results of the exam were known. He was just so impressed by this. So Martin became Horder's chief clinical assistant. 
Now, this was also providential because one of Martin's most important tasks is he would go through all the case notes of Hoarder and all of these patients that Hoarder had, he would go through all the case notes and catalog and index all the diseases that Hoarder had treated. And Lloyd-Jones was shocked here to see the kinds of conditions that some of the dignitaries of the land were suffering from including members of the cabinet and the royal family. He began to see, wait, the problems were way deeper than medical, way deeper than intellectual. The real problem, he said, was moral emptiness, spiritual hollowness. Ian Murray perceptively says, quote, Hoarder's card index was to him almost what the vision of the valley of dry bones was to the prophet Ezekiel. He just saw the poverty of it all, the hopelessness of it all. At age 23, he achieved the high honor of a London University MD. He was awarded research scholarships when he was 23 and 24, studying a a rare form of disease and then later heart disease. At the young age of 25, he'd reached the top of his profession as a A member of the Royal College of Physicians, he got a private practice on Harley Street next to Hoarder. Now, only the very cream of society could afford the services of a Harley Street doctor, so he had arrived. And Thomas Hoarder drew Martin into the world of high society, which became such an eye-opening experience to see the wickedness and excess and sin and jealousy that characterized these elites of London. It haunted him. So now comes the second trip. He's gone from Wales to London. Now he's going to go from London to Wales, leaving medicine and going into ministry. But first, something happened. He started attending Westminster Chapel, the place where he would eventually pastor. And there was a a minister there named Dr. John Hutton, And there was a spiritual power in this man's preaching that had arrested his soul, made him aware for the first time of this amazing power of God to save and change lives. He'd been in church all of his life and never had experienced this. Here's how he describes his conversion. For many years, I thought I was a Christian when in fact I was not. It was only later that I came to see that I had never been a Christian and I became one. What I needed was preaching that would convict me of sin, but I never heard this. The preaching we had was always based on the assumption that we were all Christians. In fact, he said when when he was asked to join the church and you have to go through that process, they didn't ask him if he was a Christian. The only question they gave him was, what was the name of the river that the disciples and Jesus had to cross after Gethsemane? They didn't know it. It's called the Kidron River. He got it wrong and they still let him in. That's all that it was. Everybody assumed they were Christian. During that same period, Lloyd-Jones was shocked to see the moral conditions on both ends of London society, the poor and the rich. He saw the ravaging effects of drunkenness and sexual immorality among the poor. And then he saw the equally destructive impact of drink and sex among the social elites who seemingly had everything. They seemed to have nothing. They seemed to have everything. Both were completely in the dark. He said the case histories of 70% of these problems and case histories that Hoarder was treating revealed that nothing more was wrong with them than that they ate or drank too much. Martin was troubled, haunted by the thought that he was simply in medicine helping people be able to return to sin with more abandon. Medicine could not address the real disease. Only the gospel he saw had the power to change people at the core like it had done for him. And so when he was 25 and and 26, in the summer of 1926, he, he begins to wrestle with whether he's called into the ministry. This was such turmoil of spirit that he lost 20 pounds while wrestling through this. It was so important for him. This had to be from God. He wasn't just gonna rush into this. 
By June of 1926, he was convinced that God had called him to be a preacher of the gospel. There's another momentous thing that happened in June of 1926. He proposed again to the girl of his dreams, Bethan Phillips, who was also a physician. In the first two months of 1927, he experienced three of the most stressful things you can. He got married, moved, and changed jobs. They moved to South Wales. They accepted a call to the, from the Bethlehem Forward Movement Hall. So this was the, the forward movement was the name of mission work among the Welsh Calvinistic Methodists. And he goes to Sandfield at Aberavon. Now what happened was that this was a very poor area decimated by drunkenness. And what Lloyd-Jones did was he came in, and what had happened was that people were trying desperately to fill the church, somehow to reach modern men. And they thought what they needed was to attract modern men with the things they wanted, like, like drama or more modern music. And Lloyd-Jones said, that's not what they need. Christ is the only attraction of the church. We don't need more drama. We don't need more modern music. So the the... Uh, stage on which they had, had erected for drama, he said, well, we don't need it anymore. And he said, what? Well, they said, what should we do with it? He said, well, you could use it for, for wood to heat the church. Don't need that anymore. He believed in the word and prayer. I'm devoting myself to the apostolic aim, resolving to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. And unless the spirit moves into that, nothing will happen. And at first, nothing seemed to happen until conversions began to happen. The life-changing power of the gospel began to be on display among people that nobody thought could be saved, like Mark McCann, who was the most violent, foul-mouthed person. He got so mad at his dog one day that he took out a knife and cut his dog into pieces. And here he comes into the, the preaching of the word, and he's just totally changed, totally saved. One, one spiritist medium saw people coming into the church and, and just decided, what is this about? Why are these people going to this place? And she came in and she said, I was immediately arrested with a sense of power. And I had, I'd been used to sensing power before, but this was totally different. This was a clean power. She heard the preaching of the gospel and was saved. In fact, what happens over the course of the next decade, people range in estimation between 300 to maybe 400 people were converted here. This isn't just shuffling around of the sheep where, where maybe at Sandfields they had a better children's program or better music or whatever. These are people who have no part in the church whatsoever, no interest. Come in and God just saves them by the power of the Spirit. So there's, there's drunkenness and people are saying, well, maybe we need to join the temperance movement and pass laws and, and lobby. And Lloyd-Jones says, no, they need the gospel. And what happened was that people who were totally given over to drunkenness got saved, didn't need their alcohol bottles of whiskey or whatever anymore, brought them to Lloyd-Jones and said, here, I don't, I don't need these anymore. He had a full cellar of whiskey and booze and whatever, just testifying eloquently to the power of the gospel to do what nothing else could ever do. That is the Holy Spirit. This was, he would say later, this was a touch of revival that happened. And so he began to experience, after 11 years of ministry, some vocal failure. Couldn't finish some of his sermons. Later it became apparent this was due to an error in vocal production. So at the age of 38, 1938, he resigned from the church. Didn't know what was next. He just felt like God was saying there was a very definite closing of a door before another one opened. He said, it's time, it's time to stop. The very next day, he received a letter from Dr. G. Campbell Morgan, the minister at Westminster Chapel, inviting him in London to share the preaching for six months there. He regarded that as God's providence. At the end of 1938, the Lloyd-Jones family moved to London. 
So now this is trip number three. Remember, he's been in Wales, goes to London to be an MD at Barts, and then goes from London to be a minister of the gospel in Wales. Now he's coming back to London to preach at the church where he got saved. What happens here is he, he begins to regard his time at Westminster as a temporary arrangement. So this is the next 30 years of his life, actually, 1938 to 1968. He expected to return to Wales. He was waiting to hear back about the possibility of being the, the principal at a theological college in Wales. A, no, a controversy broke out over his nomination, and Lloyd-Jones regarded that as God's providence. Everywhere, he has this huge view of God's providence. He says, well, I must, the Lord wants me to stay here at Westminster. So 1939, he accepted the call to become associate pastor at Westminster. Now remember, the last time they moved from Wales to London, World War I broke out. Guess what happens now? World War II breaks out. A few months after accepting the pastorate, September 1939, the Second World War broke out. During the war, the numbers of people at the chapel went from 2,000 to 150. So Sunday offerings could no longer pay for the expenses of the ministry and the salaries of Campbell Morgan and Lloyd-Jones. They had to be, the salaries had to be drastically reduced. Campbell Morgan just felt so terrible that he had brought Lloyd-Jones. Maybe it was a mistake. Lloyd-Jones never wavered, never wondered, was this a mistake? And what happened was that he faced the same pressure there at Westminster that he had felt in Wales, wondering, could just the, these plain services of the, the word and prayer and, and preaching, could, could that attract modern man enough? Could it fill Westminster Chapel again? Don't we need a, a choir and don't we need an organ recital and things like that? The, the deacons were wondering this and kind of challenging Lloyd-Jones, and he said, what we need is the word and the spirit. And the results were that he began to preach the gospel, and eventually the, the first gallery opened again in 1948. The second gallery in 1951, the church became completely filled again. Now, this was validation of his vision of ministry. Remember, in those days, it was in the power of the flesh that, that people thought, okay, modern man isn't coming to church anymore. We need to attract them. We, we need to get the attention of the world. Make the world take us seriously. And the solution in that day was the ecumenical movement. What we need to do is have this big, impressive, united front. Like, look how united we are, world, and make the world take us seriously by the sheer size of the church. You can't ignore us anymore. Look how big we are. And Lloyd-Jones says that's, that's the power of the flesh. That's not real. You have to downplay doctrine. You have to deny what makes somebody a Christian. You're having to say, oh, anybody that professes to be a Christian, just accept it. These Catholics and whoever. And he said, that's, that's not going to be blessed by the Lord because you're going to lowest common denominator and you're not believing in the word anymore, in the power of the spirit. In fact, he regarded the ecumenical movement and the pressures to try to unite as a widespread not believing in the power of the Spirit. That's the way he regarded it. We've ceased believing in the Holy Spirit. He said the problem with the church is that it had lost trust in the truth of the Bible, lost confidence in preaching, no longer believed in the Holy Spirit. He saw this as a valley of dry bones and he thought, what's the solution to this? What are you going to do when you see this deadness? What's the ecumenical movement going to do? Any more than today, what's the pressure you feel? How are we going to get people into church? If it's a valley of dry bones, do you really think that maybe what is going to attract them is if we could just get Starbucks in the sanctuary? Maybe that's what would help. Or bone broth, maybe, for dry bones. Like the, what would actually make the difference? For Lloyd-Jones, it was again the Word and the Spirit, not believing in the power of the flesh. And it did. R.C. Sproul, looking at Lloyd-Jones, said, 
that Martin Lloyd-Jones was to 20th century England what Charles Spurgeon was to 19th century England. There's nothing new under the sun. Remember the downgrade controversy in Spurgeon's day, liberal theology coming in, everybody's saying, well, let's, let's just be one, and let's, we got to cater to modern man, and, and Spurgeon said, no, we cannot lose sound doctrine. The same thing is happening again with Lloyd-Jones. Now, at this time, 1968, he suddenly retires. This is trip number four now. He's been in London. Now he's, begin, he's going to show this ministry to the wider world. He discovers that he has colon cancer. No one knew it at the time, but he preached his last sermon at Westminster Chapel, March 1st, 1968. And after a successful surgery, he suddenly announced his retirement. He said, people were never going to let me retire. Now they have to. His ministry would reach further than ever now. He began editing his sermon manuscripts for publication. He never wrote a book. All the books that you have of Martin Lloyd-Jones were never written by him. They were all sermons or addresses. And he begins to now edit them for publication, accept invitations to preach near and far. One notable trip was he went to America to Westminster Seminary and did 16 lectures on preaching and these, pre- these lectures became his landmark book, Preaching and Preachers. He preaches his last sermon at age 80. And now we have trip number five, where he goes from London to heaven. Two days before his death, Lloyd-Jones wrote a note with a trembling hand to his wife and children. Don't pray for healing. Don't hold me back from the glory. That was his special phrase for heaven. He never called it heaven. He called it the glory. His eldest daughter, Elizabeth, said the glory of God was the golden thread in the tapestry of his ministry and life. She said it was so essentially part of him. Because of the greatness and glory of God, it made salvation so much grander that this great God would come down so low to save us. This love that he had for God's glory and greatness, it was his greatest characteristic and quality. And she said, I so miss it. He never got over how far the Most High God came down to save him. When they were planning his funeral, he got one of his friends, Vernon Hyam, to to preach the funeral. He said, I want you to preach on the loveliness of Christ and an abundant entrance into the heavenly kingdom. And and Vernon Hyam was, I'll do that. He was ready to leave. He said, now come back here, my boy. Here's what I want you to remember. One thing, I am only a forgiven sinner. There's nothing more to me than that. Don't you ever forget it. It's like as the body is wasting away, the spirit is just fiercely saying, oh, it's only Jesus. It's only Jesus. Let everybody know that. Don't make this about me. It's Jesus. The day of his heavenly home going was March 1st, 1981, exactly 13 years to the day after he preached his last sermon at Westminster. His earthly body took a trip from London back to Wales one last time, buried at Newcastle Emlyn near Cardigan. He chose this burial place because of his great affection for Bethan. Her family was buried there. In that Welsh graveyard, there's a tomb, simple tomb with a message inscribed on it that just sums up his whole life and ministry. The very words of the text he preached in his first sermon at Aberavon 55 years earlier. Martin Lloyd-Jones, 1899 to 1981. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and him crucified. 1 Corinthians 2, 2. Oh, he was a preacher, but he was so much more. One of the things that ministered to me so much was the description of his dying days when friends would come over to visit him and try to encourage him, and he was so sick that it would take him forever to get from his chair to his bed. And people would come over to encourage him, and they would end up getting depressed watching him. Like, you, you used to be this powerful preacher, this lion in the pulpit, and now look, this is pitiful. It's hard to watch. How do you possibly stay encouraged? And he just quoted a Bible verse. 
Luke 10. Don't rejoice that the demons are subject to your name. Rejoice that your names are written in heaven. And he said, why would I be discouraged? I'm no less saved today than I was when I was preaching salvation. In fact, salvation is nearer than when I first believed. He didn't get an identity from ministry. It's not that he was working for an identity in ministry. He was preaching from an identity in ministry. He said, there's no greater thing in all the universe than being a Christian. That was his identity. Are you trying to get an identity from ministry? From the the ups and downs of, of successes and failures and how are you doing? Well, if things are going well, then I'm doing well. Or is it that your joy is in the fact that you're saved. No less saved on the good days than on the hard days. So here's what I want to do. I want to just look at two aspects then of his life that I think challenge us so much. First, let's look at his view of preaching in the Holy Spirit. What he looked at in the modern church, he said the root disease is unbelief. Here's what he says. The church and her own leaders, what happened? They began to criticize this book. Listen to him talk about the word now. They began to criticize this book. They began to set themselves up as authorities to deny certain aspects of the teaching. They deny the God of the Old Testament. They don't believe in him, they say. They made a mere man out of the Lord of glory. They deny his virgin birth, his miracles, his atonement. They deny the person of the Holy Spirit. They reduce this Bible to a book of ethics and morals. That's why the church is as she is. The church has rebelled in her doctrine and in her belief. She has set up the wisdom of men in the place of the wisdom of God. She's become proud of her learning, of her knowledge. What she asked about her preachers and servants was no longer, is he filled with the Spirit? Has he a living experience of God? But now, is he cultivated? Is he cultured? What are his degrees? So here's the doctor's prescription. If that's the problem, they don't believe in the Word and the Spirit anymore, then bring them together. That's the solution. Bring them together. And so, here's what he said. What you need is expository preaching and anointed preaching. Expository preaching says you this, you're taking the word seriously. You're making sure that what you're preaching, what you're saying, comes out of the Bible, always from it, always that's the origin. He practiced expository preaching in a day where he had fallen into disuse. It had been forgotten. And it's recovered now in his ministry so that people see not just the necessity of it, but the beauty of it, the majesty of the word. And so here's what he says. Here's what we need in expository preaching. We need the golden rule of preaching, which is be honest with the text. At this point, there's one golden rule, one absolute demand, honesty have to be honest with the text. I mean by that, you don't just go to a text to pick out an idea which interests you and then deal with it yourself. That is to be dishonest with the text. You're a steward of it. You don't have to give the word a makeover, just give it a voice. It is the word of God. It is spirit and life. Proclaim it. Give it a voice. Give it a body. Give it mannerisms, whatever. Make it dominate all of you. But that's only part. He would tell his people, I I spend half my time telling people to study, study doctrine and the word, and the other half telling them it's not enough. Because if you've prepared the sermon this way, you're only half done. That's like Elijah preparing the wood for the sacrifice. Now you need the fire to fall. Only God can do that. He believed that people were trying to supplement preaching with drama or music or things because they had never heard spirit-filled, anointed preaching. Here's what he said. Without the spirit, a preacher is only reading his notes. 
He's only repeating words in reliance upon human oratory. And everybody knew the difference immediately. J.I. Packer first heard Lloyd-Jones preach when Packer was 22 years old as a student in London. He describes his first encounter at Westminster Chapel with Lloyd-Jones. He said the preacher was a small man, had a big head, evidently thinning hair, wearing a shapeless-looking black gown. His great domed forehead caught the eye at once. Not, Not a great first impression. The auditorium lights went out and he launched into a 45-minute sermon. The sermon, as we say nowadays, blew me away. He said, what was special about it? It was simple, clear, straightforward, man-to-man stuff. It was expository. It was evangelistic on the grand scale. It was both the planned performance of a magnetic orator and the passionate, compassionate outflow of a man with a message from God that he knew his hearers needed. He worked his way up to a dramatic growling shout about God's sovereign grace a few minutes before the end. And then from there, he worked down to business-like persuasion calling on needy souls to come to Christ. It was the old, old story, but it had been made wonderfully new. I went out full of awe and joy with a more vivid sense of the greatness of God in my heart than I'd ever known before. Packer said, here's his legacy. I've never heard another preacher with so much of God about him. He left you with a greater sense of God. Now, Lloyd-Jones says you you can't forecast the wind of the Spirit moving and preaching. He, He said that the pulpit is one of the most romantic places on the planet because the romance of preaching, you never know what's going to happen. You can never forecast what's going to happen. Here's what he said. The most romantic place on earth is the pulpit. I ascend the pulpit stairs Sunday after Sunday, and I never know what's going to happen. I confess, I come expecting nothing at times. Suddenly, though, the power is given. At other times, I think I have a great deal because of my preparation, but alas, there's no power in it. Thank God it is like that. I do my utmost, but He controls the supply and the power. He infuses it. One of my favorite quotes from... The documentary Logic on Fire was was a woman who there heard the doctor preach frequently and she described this variable experience of the Spirit's presence. She says, sometimes it was like this great stillness came over everything and you were just so caught up in God's presence. And other times you said to yourself, oh, the doctor was on his own this week. Can I tell you how encouraging that was to me just to hear that he had that happen too? He said, you never know what's going to happen. Sometimes preaching feels like it's just work and you're just rowing and struggling and straining at the earth. Sometimes it feels like gliding, like God is doing this. Lloyd-Jones said, the impact of the Holy Spirit has an impact first on the preacher It gives clarity of thought, clarity of speech, ease of utterance, a great sense of authority and confidence as you're preaching, an awareness of power that's not your own, thrilling through the whole of your body. Oh, it's an indescribable sense of joy. You are a man possessed, taken hold of, taken up. I like to put it like this. I I know nothing on earth comparable to this feeling. That When this happens, you have the feeling that you're not actually doing the preaching. You're looking on. You're looking at yourself in amazement as this is happening. It's not your effort. You're just the instrument, the channel, the vehicle. The Spirit is using you, and you're looking on in great enjoyment and freedom of the Spirit and astonishment. What kind of idiot wouldn't want that, right? To quote somebody. (laughs) He, He then described the impact that the Spirit has upon the people what about the people? Oh, they sense it at once. They can tell the difference immediately. They're gripped. They become serious. They're convicted. They're moved. They're humbled. Some are convicted of sin. Others are lifted up to the heavens. Anything can happen to any one of them. 
They all know at once something quite unusual and exceptional is happening, and as a result, they begin to delight in the things of God, and they want more and more. They don't want it to end. He said what happens is that they start as the judge of the preacher's performance. Oh, I like this illustration, didn't like this point. And suddenly they go from being the judge to being judged by God. They realize they're in God's presence. And they stop saying things like, well, how did the preacher do? And they start saying, how did your soul do under that word from God? The process of seeking the Spirit's power He said, don't separate word and spirit here. Not like give word in sermon preparation and then you pray for the spirit. He says, the spirit, the prayer for anointing starts in the study. It starts in preparation. Urge, he urges us to seek, expect, and yield to this power of the spirit as the supreme thing, even in the study, being content with nothing less. Without this, there's always the danger you're going to put your faith in your preparation. Put your faith in the sermon rather than in the spirit. Now, I have a whole section on this. I just would love to say more about it. I'm going to say it really quickly. What he believed, the kind of preaching that God blesses for conversion. He was, he was an evangelist through and through. A man of prayer first, his wife said, and then an evangelist. What he did was he said the kind of preaching that God blesses is the kind of preaching that doesn't try to soothe the conscience think Joel Olstein today. There's a lot of people trying to soothe the conscience, make it feel better. He says, rather than trying to soothe the conscience, you're trying to awaken it. You're trying to show the, the sin that's there. You're trying to show the greatness of God that's there. You're preaching in a way that awakens rather than soothes. I wish I could say so much more about that. Let's move to praying in the Spirit. I just want to close here. What is that? If if there's preaching in the flesh where you're just aware, this feels like hard work, like I'm rowing and struggling, and preaching in the Spirit just feels like I'm I'm gliding, I'm looking on, God's doing this, the power's not coming from me, even the ease of utterance here. The same thing happens with praying in the Spirit. He said the two most romantic places on earth are the pulpit and the prayer closet. Do you have a devotion to the word, ministry of the word, and prayer? Is this the most exciting place for you? A communion with God. He said the difference between praying in the flesh and praying in the spirit is this. Prayer in the realm or the power of the flesh is relying upon your human ability and your effort to carry the prayer forward. You can struggle to concentrate, have your mind wander, find it difficult to gather your thoughts. And then you begin to rely upon human effort. How long we pray, how well we pray, is it perfectly composed, doctrinally correct, rely upon diction and language and cadence and emotion and volume, or is it the Spirit doing it? In the flesh, we're doing the carrying, we're doing the pushing. Here's what he says, we all know what it's like to feel deadness in prayer, difficulty in prayer, to be tongue-tied, nothing to say as it were, having to force ourselves to try. Well, to the extent that's true of us, we're not praying in the Spirit. The Spirit is a Spirit of life as well as truth, and the first thing he always does is make everything living and vital, and there's all the difference in the world between the life and liveliness produced by the Spirit in prayer and the kind of artifact the bright, breezy imitation produced by people. Trying to work it up, sound eloquent in their prayer. It's totally different, he said. Now, the the best way that I could try to describe this is my wife and I went on a bike ride in Stillwater, and I, I didn't know anything about the trail. So we started the first part of the trail, and I didn't know, at times it just felt really hard, like we were struggling, and you know, your, your legs start straining a little bit, and you're just working hard, and I didn't realize how much of an incline there was. And on the way back, I couldn't believe how easy it felt. Like, man, I could do this all day. Like, I didn't realize there was an incline, and now a decline, and it feels, am I even biking? Am I even doing this? Like, this is great. I like this so much more than the ride up. 
That's the difference between praying in the flesh where it just feels like you're struggling and you're doing the effort and praying in the spirit where God is doing this. He's carrying this along. He's giving me words. So here's what he said. Here's how to do this. Three steps, he said. First thing we need to do is we need to admit our inability to pray. We do not know how to pray as we ought. So don't trust your own ability. Lean on your own ability to pray. Start with the recognition that prayer is a spiritual activity and the power of the flesh profits nothing at all. We feel dryness and difficulty and we confess to him our dullness, our spiritual slowness, our sluggishness. We start with the flesh profits nothing. I'm not gonna rely upon my human ability to pray. Then what you do, once the spirit shows up, what you do is you enjoy prayer as communion with God first. You don't rush to say anything. What, being in God's presence matters so much more than anything you're gonna say. Here's this quote. You're aware now of a communion, a sharing, a give and take, if I can use that expression. You're no longer dragging yourself along, forcing the situation. You're not trying to make conversation with somebody you don't know. No, no, the spirit of adoption has brought you right into the presence of God and it becomes a living act of fellowship and communion, vibrant with life. Have you had this experience where you're like in the living room struggling to pray, Lord, I can't do this, and suddenly the living room becomes like the throne room and you realize I'm in God's presence. And he says, don't rush to say stuff when you get there. Don't have this kind of breezy familiarity. An awareness of his presence is so much more important than anything you're going to say. Then, once you admit your inability to pray and, and, and begin to enjoy and experience prayer as communion with God, then you begin the holy boldness of pleading with God. You use the word of God now, all the arguments of God, all the promises of God. You you bring that to God's presence. You have an awakened sense of intimacy and awe. You know, I can can pray for great things because I know you. Here's what he said. Don't claim, don't demand. Just let your requests be made known. Let them come from your heart. God will understand. Pray urgently, plead with God, use all the arguments, all the promises, but never demand. Don't put yourself into the position of saying, if we only do this, then this must happen. God is the sovereign Lord. These things are beyond our understanding. Never let the terminology of claiming, maybe and claim it, something like that, enter into your vocabulary. Now, Lloyd-Jones believed so much in prayer, that he said the quickest way to quench the spirit is not to obey an impulse to pray. You see why? He said, your flesh isn't going to prompt you to pray. The devil is not going to prompt you to pray. That's the spirit. Prize those prompts and give yourself to it right away. This is not something that's like another point in the manuscript for me. Like, this is so personal. One day when I was doing doctoral work at Southern Baptist Seminary in Louisville, I was uh, working the the night shift, the graveyard shift at UPS. Never got enough sleep. One night I was driving home, 4.30 in the morning. I was struggling to stay awake. You know, you feel that drowsiness, that jello neck thing starting to happen. And you, you just can't snap yourself out of it, no matter what you try. Like you crank up the, the music and roll down the window. I even tried slapping myself to wake up. Whoa, this is bad. I'm starting to drift. And then the next thing you know, I woke up in my driveway. I have no idea how I got home. 
Walk into the house, normally my wife is sound asleep, it's 4.30 in the morning. Or usually she'll acknowledge me and then roll over. I was, I was just, everything was just felt surreal, like what am I even doing alive? I walked into my bedroom, my wife is sitting straight up in bed, like, hey, how you doing? She's like, how was your drive? I said, well, it's actually weird you would say that. I was falling asleep, and I don't know how I made it here. She said, yeah, I figured. I said, okay, what's going on? You're wide awake. Quit, quit talking in code. She said, well, at about 4.30, I, I felt the Lord just suddenly wake me up. And I felt this intense pressure and burden to pray. I looked at the time, I knew that's normally when you're driving home, and so I just gave myself to pray for you. I'm alive because she didn't quench the spirit. Do you prize these prompts of the spirit? in your ministry. Do you, do, you, do you call for this? Do you believe, I can't do this on my own. I just need you all the time. And it doesn't have to be this massively long prayer time. It can be. But also throughout the day, just keeping in step with the Spirit and saying, God, I'm yours. And whenever you prompt me, I will immediately drop everything and obey because I need you that much. Father, I ask that as a result of this conference, God, could it be that prayer lives would change, would just take a turning point today? Prayer life might have been, might look like a valley of dry bones, but that's because you've been trying to do it on your own. Do it in the power of the Spirit. Would it be that people would come away from this conference and people in the pew would say, what's different? What's different? There's something different here. I pray that pastors and, and, and wives and ministry leaders would, would have a, a, a thicker skin for criticism because they're saying, I'd, I'd rather have the presence of the Spirit Spirit, even if it means the presence of criticism. Lord, would you, would you sear this into us that we would not dare separate light and heat, doctrine and life, word and spirit. In Jesus' name. Amen.